Good morning. He's worthy of it all. He deserves the glory. And everything we have to share this morning um, is from him, through him, and for him. We're the Deeds family, um, my husband Will and I, and our four kids, Abra, Ezra, Salem, and Simeon. And we live in Guatemala in a town called Panahachel on Lake Atitlan. We've shared here the last couple of years, and some of you maybe remember us, some of you maybe not, but we're going to give a little update this morning. We have been serving in Guatemala in some capacity for 10 years. We lived there before, and then we came back to the States for a few years, and my husband was a pastor. And during that time, we met Pastor Fred and a few of you. And in 2021, October, we moved back to Guatemala again, and we were serving with an organization called La Casa de la Paz. A lot has happened in the last two years in our lives, as I'm sure in your lives as well. And we're no longer serving with La Casa de la Paz. We started a new ministry this year called Animo. We started it in May. Now, if you're not sure what word I'm saying up here, it's because it's in Spanish. We use this word in Animo in Guatemala to encourage other people. It's like we're saying, take courage. You can do this. And so we're going to encourage one another this morning, and you're going to turn to someone beside you that you think might need some encouragement, and you're going to tell them, ánimo. you got to say it with a little bit of excitement, otherwise it doesn't really work. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Ánimo. Pretty good. You sound pretty fluent with your one word. So we chose this as the name of our organization because our mission is to empower Guatemalans for work in ministry. We believe that's done through discipleship, just as this church has very obviously been discipling people, because all of you are here because someone is discipling you in some form. And we believe that projects are important and necessary at times, but people are God's heart. And so we focus on relationship to remember that we have a little catchphrase we started called people over projects to help us remember. And that might be something good for you to remember, too. Projects are easy because you can see the results. But people are who we are focusing on. So in May, we officially began. But really, the ministry of Animo started right after we moved to Guatemala. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that story because your church has supported us. And I feel like it's probably important for you to know how God has been using you in Guatemala, even if you've never been there. Although we do have a few people this morning that have come down to visit us recently, which is exciting. So when we moved to, to back to Guatemala, we pretty quickly met a guy on the streets named Victor. We shared his testimony last year through a video, but if you weren't here, I'll quickly summarize. He had been blind for four years. He couldn't walk. He was begging on the streets when we met him. He was completely alone in life. He had no friends, and his only family member he'd ever had, his mom, had just died from alcoholism right before we met him. And he himself was an alcoholic. So he had a lot of needs, but when we met him, he didn't ask for help with those things, he asked for friends. And we became his friends, and through friendship, he began to have hope and made the committed decision that he was going to stop drinking. And as soon as he made that decision, blessings, miracles, and purpose began to pour into his life. And in short, now he can see. He's no longer lame, he runs. He's no longer a beggar. He has his own business, which some of you might have saw as you came in. You can help support that today. He is no longer alone. He has friends. He has Our family is his family now. And he's using his past of alcoholism and drug addiction to lead others out of addiction, which is something new that's happened this past year. So as people were passing by him on the street, they saw someone like, you would never see this guy and think, well, there's a lot of hope for this guy. That's probably the most humble circumstance you could be in. But God saw and was seeing something different, someone that had a great purpose still. And he sees that in each one of us. Some of us maybe don't always look like we have a hopeful future, but he sees the great purpose that he has put before us. So as we were walking in relationship with Victor and began discipling him, he started to wonder, why has God saved my life? It's for a reason. And he began to feel like it was to lead others out of addiction. It's a huge problem in Guatemala. Every time we're out on the streets, we run into guys stumbling around and many passed out on the street because they, what started as just a little drink every now and then, quickly led to not being able to stop. And many of them end up losing their families, their jobs, living on the streets 
and are viewed as the rejected ones in town, that everyone's given up on, nobody really wants to help them, there's no hope for them. So the devil is using alcoholism and addiction in Guatemala to destroy the lives of men, particularly, who have a great purpose and are very talented, and then through that, destroying the family. So if, if you have no father in the family, the whole family begins to break down. And how many of you believe that a family is a very powerful tool in the kingdom of God, a healthy family? God works through families. So, of course, the devil wants to destroy that. At the same time, we were beginning to realize that this is happening partly because men don't realize that God has a great purpose for them. That's why they have no hope. And so we, we became passionate about beginning to help men discover who God has called them to be because we believe that's a key to healthy families. And Victor was also becoming passionate about helping these guys with addictions. So in November of this year, our family and Victor were out on the streets, and we met another alcoholic guy named Julian. And he was kind of the catalyst for the, the ministry of Animo be, um, began to accelerate because of him. So I think there's a video that's going to play. There's some sound. This is Julian. <laughs> Here we go. What we believe is that this is definitely not the end of his story. God is moving on his behalf. We met Julian one day in November while our church was having an outdoor marimba celebration for their 15 year anniversary. Julian liked the marimba music and he sat down and began humming to some of the hymns. This caught my attention and I went and sat down by him. He was drunk but was able to carry on a conversation and I invited him to come sit with us at our church service. After the service, we had a really nice meal and Julian sat with us at our table. I asked him if we would, he would agree to go to rehab and he said yes, but when I got back to the van, he had changed his mind and left. Then, on January 23rd, a Monday morning, There's the beginning that you missed earlier. <laughs> Julian used to be an elementary teacher. That's what the beginning said, basically. So at the end of January, we made that video. Right after putting these three guys in rehab, we began to get to know them and try to be their friends. And we found out, guess what? They'd all lost their families. They'd all lost their jobs. And they all had nowhere to live. After rehab, they'd be going back to the streets. What do you think the success rate is for somebody coming out of rehab and going back to living on the streets? Will they stay sober? Probably 0% chance, pretty much, right? So we looked at each other and called to mind a scripture that is kind of a theme for us. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And we, the three of us, Will, Victor, and I looked at each other, and we knew we could do something about housing for these guys. So if we say we love God, what did we have to do? Find housing. So we, on March 1st, opened up a house for these, we thought, for just these three guys to live in temporarily while we got them off their feet. But actually, we were starting a halfway house. Sometimes it's best that we don't know what God has in store, right? We probably say, no, I don't want to do that. And so very quickly, 
we began to meet other people on the streets. They heard Victor's story, they heard about us, and they would be out waiting outside our gate in the mornings. They'd find us on the street and say, oh, you're the people helping um, guys go to rehab. And so the ministry just began um, to be unavoidable. It became so obvious that God was putting these people on our path, and we couldn't say no. We get to know them on the streets. We usually provide a meal for them if they haven't eaten, lots of love. We pray for them. We speak truth to them. We offer for them to go to rehab if they want to, but it's always voluntary. If we coerce or force them to, it works in reverse. Once they're in rehab, Will and Victor do services in the rehab center a couple times a month. Here we go. While they're in rehab, we cover the cost for them to be in rehab. We provide all their food and their physical needs. On Sundays is family visit day, but none of them have families that want to come visit them. So we try to fill that gap, and we're their family, and we come go and visit them, and we take food for the guys in there to help brighten their life. The whole purpose of that is discipleship and building relationship. So far since March, we've had 14 men go into um, rehab, and then they have the opportunity to come into our Casa de Animo, our halfway house. There's that word again, the animo word that you were saying, house of encouragement. So far, we've had that, that number said 12. Actually, this week, we just had two more guys come into our house, so now we have 14 that have been in our halfway house, ranging in age from 21 to 64. While they're in our house, we um, cover the cost of living in the house, as well as most of their food and supplies. The goal is that they have to be sober to be in the house, and we use the house to create an environment of healing, encouragement, peace, something they haven't experienced on the streets or in the rehab center. Victor is the leader of this ministry. He lives in the house with the guys, and he does a Monday, Wednesday, Friday Bible study and therapy time with them. On Mondays, our family gets to participate and help with the worship time. And this is in the house. On Thursdays, we have a men's group that meets in our house, a men's Bible study, and our, our animal guys come and participate that. So they're always welcome in our home. At least once a month, I cook a big meal for them in the, in the halfway house, and we have fellowship and games together. We treat them like family. Um, Will and Victor do discipleship trips with them, and then we include them in things that our family is doing. We took them to the zoo, and we have them over to our house. Our little guy um, loves to have the guys give him shoulder rides. We try to make them feel very, very loved and included in a family, something they haven't experienced for a very long time. The whole purpose of this is discipleship, helping them see who God has created them to be. For some of that, them, that has meant some small businesses. When you came in, you might have seen our table out in the, the foyer area. And those are some of the small businesses you can support. We have one guy that is heading up a coffee um, business for us, but he, I'm sorry to say that we did sell out of all the coffee like a long time ago because we could only bring back like 34 pounds. That didn't go very far. So um, maybe next time we'll have some coffee for you. And we have another guy making rings that you can buy out on the table. His name is Miguel. And then you can also support Victor um, through his business, From Darkness to Light is what he calls his business. He's an artisan, and he makes bracelets and dream catchers, and he just started making really beautiful earrings as well. The bracelets are all adjustable for men, women, and children. And this is how he supports himself so that he can lead the ministry. So you, um, if you support him, it's helping him specifically, but also allowing our ministry to be possible. This is how our ministry is possible. So we really appreciate your help with any of that, and it's a great story to share as well. Also, we have t-shirts that we have this year that also help support our overall ministry. So come see our table for that. Also, we'd love for you to come pick up one of these brochures that just tells a little bit of information, has our website and our contact info. And you can also come pick up one of these cards. This is to um, let us know that you want to commit to praying for us or if you want to receive our newsletter. Don't worry, it's not like a daily thing that we bombard you with. It's like a few times a year. And also, if you would like to support us financially, 
Our biggest need right now are um, monthly supporters. We do not have our monthly budget met, so if that's something you would be able to help us with, it would help our ministry continue in Guatemala. We also are trying to purchase the halfway house, so you could help with that. And $100 sends a guy to rehab for a month. $50 a month supports a guy in our halfway house. So that's who we are. We're um, leading the ministry of Animo, uh, Will and Amber Deeds, along with Victor. And we believe God is, just as we've discipled and now Victor's discipling, we know God is going to multiply that, just as he's multiplied and is going to multiply this church as well. I want to end with Psalm 113, verse 7 through 8. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. That's God's heart. That's who you serve. That's who we serve. And we get to join them both in this community and in Guatemala in doing this, resurrecting people to where they're supposed to be. Uh, we're going to share another video, and then my husband's going to share with you. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for helping us fuel a great awakening in Guatemala. And we truly believe that that's what God is doing in, in these men in Guatemala. We, we like to use the symbol of a volcano because there's volcanoes in Guatemala. We don't want those to awaken. That would be not a good thing. But we really want a power and a potential to explode in Guatemala that I believe is more powerful than a volcano, and that is a human life. You know, there is great power and potential in each one of us. God sees it in each of us. He sees it when we're at our lowest point in our life. God sees the power and potential, and he is calling out to all of us, wake up, O oh sleeper, rise from the dead, and I will shine on you. God is doing that all over the world. He's doing that through you guys. He's doing that in Guatemala. God is waking people up who have been asleep for a very long time. And he wants to wake up more people in Guatemala and here. God compares us to lost sheep in the Bible. He says like we're like lost sheep that, that have gone astray. And he goes and he seeks after us. It says he even leaves the 99 to go and find the one. Now that doesn't seem very efficient, does it? We, sh we, we should just stay with the 99 because that's where the multitude is at. That's where all the people are at. But God says that he leaves the 99 to go find one. That doesn't fit with our culture because our culture would say, let's stay with the, the crowd and, and focus on them because that's what's important, right? The crowd. But God says, I leave the 99 and I go and seek out that one. 
God sees the potential even in the one that is lost. God sees the great potential. And I hear him whispering in my ear while I'm walking the streets of Guatemala. I hear him whispering in my ear a question. A question about these men who my family, we have to step over them as we walk to the grocery store. I hear him whisper in my ear a question he whispered to Ezekiel in the scriptures. He says to Ezekiel the prophet, do you think that these dry bones can live? God had just given Ezekiel a vision because his people were depressed. They were without hope because they had just been ripped from their homes and taken to a foreign land. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be the people of Israel being ripped from their homeland, taken to a foreign land, and their temple and their church, it got burned to the ground. And they were made slaves in Babylon. And God, in this moment, wants to encourage his people. And so he reaches out to a man who's been listening, a man named Ezekiel, and he gives him a vision of what he wants to do for the people of Israel. And he says to Ezekiel, look at this. And he shows him a valley. And the valley is filled with a bunch of dead, dry bones. That seems hopeful, right? (laughs) Wow, thanks God. Thanks for this wonderful vision. And then God asks Ezekiel a question. He says, Ezekiel, do you think that these bones could live? And Ezekiel responds, probably like a lot of us would respond with a little bit of doubt in his voice. Well, God, only you, sovereign Lord, know if these bones can live or not. And I I find myself saying the same thing when God says that to me as I step over these dry bones on the streets. God asks me the question, Will, do you think that these bones can live? And I find myself saying, God, I don't know. I really don't know. Only you know if these bones can can live. But God doesn't let Ezekiel, and he doesn't let me stay there in that moment. He says to Ezekiel, he says, prophesy to these dry bones, Ezekiel. You would think God would just be like, here, let me show you. I'll show you that these bones can live. Boom. But no, he gives the responsibility to Ezekiel. And he says, Ezekiel, I want you to speak my truth. I want you to speak my word to these dry bones and tell them, come alive, take on flesh. And so Ezekiel takes that responsibility, speaks to the dry bones, and guess what happens? They can live. They can live. Ezekiel speaks to the dry bones and they begin to take on flesh and they come alive. God wants to do the same thing with us because this is what God does in the world. He speaks And things come alive. In Romans chapter 4, it says this. Can you put that Romans passage up there for me? It says that God is the God who speaks to things that do not exist and makes them come alive. That's basically what it is because I can't remember what it is. Can you put that up there? It's not up there. Romans chapter 4, it says he's the God who speaks to to things as if they were and he speaks them into existence that's what God does in the world through us and he's doing it with the men in Guatemala and he's doing it with all of us now the word for this is prophecy to speak to something as if it wasn't as if it were you speak things into existence God uses us as a mouthpiece to speak his truth into the world. He uses us to do that. Any of, any of you ever prophesied before? God wants to use you to prophesy. Now, what does that look like in the real world? Let me tell you what it looks like. My dad was a truck driver, and I got to go with him on a trip one time. He was going to Dayton, Ohio. Really exciting journey. And I got to join him in the cab of the truck. And as we're driving, he pops in a tape into the cassette de- deck. That's how old I am. He pops the cassette in, and it's the cassette tape to Cocktail, the soundtrack. Anybody ever watch the movie Cocktail? 
I never watched it, but my dad had the tape deck and he put it in there and all these songs come on and we're singing to these songs. One of them was like, don't worry, be happy. You remember that one? Can't hit those high notes anymore. But we were singing to that song and my dad looks over at me across the truck and he says to me, wow, you're a great singer, Will. God wants to use your voice to sing. That's prophecy. Because later on in life, I went and I joined the high school choir. And I began singing and developing my voice. I began becoming the singer that my dad prophesied about in that truck. That's what prophecy looks like in the real world. You speak things into existence. My dad had no idea what he was doing in that moment. He was just trying to encourage his son and tell him that he had a good voice. Later on, I, I got hired as a, a, a worship director at a church uh, north of town called Lifehouse. It was Huntertown UMC when I worked there. And I used my voice for the Lord. God wants us to prophesy over people. The people who are around you in your life. God is calling you to speak life into them. You see, there are people in your family that are feeling dry, like a pile of dry bones. And they need a word from the Lord. And God is, wants to give you a vision of who they are, who they're called to be. The way you're going to achieve that first is by communicating with God. I love it that you guys are start. you have this prayer room that you're starting and you're going to be communicating with God because that's how you receive a vision from God about other people. So you need to be communicating with God, but you not just like your needs and your wants, but when you come to God, you need to ask him about your children. You need to ask him about the people that are in your life. God, what is your vision for my child? What is your vision for my coworker? What is your vision for the guy that I pass by every day? What is your vision for them? And then God is going to speak to you about them, and he's going to say, speak this to the dry bones. Speak this to your family members. Speak this to your coworker. And then you get the opportunity to go and speak life into the dry and watch it come alive. Isn't that awesome? I love it. We've gotten to do that with our friend Victor. And when we saw him, he looked like a pile of dry bones. And let me tell you, it was not efficient at all. When we were right back in our newsletters to the States, we would say, here's what we're doing. We're, we're spending time with one guy. <laughs> and you write back to the church and you're like, wow, that's impressive. Look at that ministry. Wow. But God doesn't work on efficiency. He sees the value in every human life and he takes the time for every person and then he multiplies it the way that only God can do it. God wants to use you to prophesy to the people around you. But you have to be in conversation with him and then you have to be bold enough to speak that word of prophecy to the people around you. We thank you for allowing us to come and share with you. Thank you for allowing us to, uh, to prophesy a little bit this morning, to speak God's truth into your life. And I want to encourage you to prophesy over the dry bones in your life. Would you pray with me? God, I see your people. I see them. I see the power and the potential in each of their lives a great awakening that's happening here in Fort Wayne. And God, we speak life into them this morning, life into the, the, those who feel dry. God, that you would moisten their bones this morning with your spirit, that they would come alive in your name and that they would begin to speak to the dry bones in their lives. Bring that one person into their mind, God, the one 
that you want them to seek after this week. And speak to them the vision for that one. Speak to them a word, a prophecy for their, their family, for their coworker, the person that you have for them. Speak life, God, to us this morning, that we may speak it to others. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, that's so good. I just want to bless the, the Deeds family. Isn't that incredible to see like them pouring into one, fam, uh, one, one man last year? And Victor has been victorious, and uh, God is using him. <laughs> and, and just to see that expand has been, been wonderful. Um, I want you to do some animo uh, this morning. Uh, <laughs> encourage somebody around you. If you see a little kid that was near you that was really good, like, man, you put your arm around them and say, man, I'm so proud of you. And make sure you get some candy from Pastor Fred. <laughs> um, and I want to tell one, like this point of light. Um, there was a, in my first church, there was this 80-year-old woman, at least 80, maybe, maybe much older than 80, that she noticed that when she'd look out her window in the morning, that the kids would stand around the bus stop and they would kind of like hit each other and kind of were just goofing off and stuff. And it so disturbed her that she decided that every morning she was going to get up and go stand at the bus stop with the kids. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Like just get out of her house and go stand at the bus stop with her. She became known as the candy lady. Like they would cut, like those kids, when they'd get off the bus, they would come by her house and that she would animo, she would encourage them, that she would speak into their lives. And guess what her funeral was like? Um, guess where the fruit of her life came? It, would, it came after she was 80. Um, mm -hmm. That was the big moment. I, I, I want that for you. I want that for you. What I pray is that you could see a need, that you would have courage to step out and meet that need. So let's stand together, and we're going um, we're gonna to make a confession out loud. Um, Lord, be Lord of my eyes. Can you say that? Lord, be Lord of my eyes. Lord, I want to see my eyes, Lord. I want to see what you see. I want to see what you Lord, see. Lord, be Lord of my mouth. May I encourage. Lord, be Lord of my mouth. Lord, be Lord of my mouth. Lord, be Lord of my ears. May I Lord, hear your Lord voice and follow you. So take a moment here today. Don't rush out of this place. Look around and see who could you get to know? Who could you pray with? Who could you encourage? It's a lot easier to practice that in here than going out and just practicing that in the world. So we love you. Go and be the church. Amen.